thank you everyone for coming out today on such a nice evening. I know I have the real diehard Northwest Coast Native Art and Culture people here if you're going to come in on a sunny October evening to, to sit in the dark and watch slides. But thank you very much for coming tonight. It's This is my uh, my first public presentation here in the APK and I, it's pretty exciting for me to get to speak in our wonderful new building and have to learn all the uh, high-tech instructions for how to run everything so I apologize in advance for messing this up I'm sure it's gonna happen so <laughs> uh, sorry about that but uh, to start out tonight I'd like to introduce um, Michael Beasley Mick Beasley who has um, uh, been long, a longtime resident of Juno and a, a real asset to the community he, he and his brother Rick You've probably uh, seen their work before and uh, on displays all over the place, and uh, they're frequently teaching classes, and uh, we're really lucky to have them in our community. And I thought that Mick would be an ideal person to come uh, and talk to us today about the process of building a dugout canoe. And uh, uh, when when I'm asked to explain the process to people, I start out by by uh, by giving the executive summary of the process which is uh, you take a log cut away everything that doesn't look like a canoe and there you have it but it is a little more involved than that as as you will see when when uh, Mick goes through um, his set of slides showing the complete process and then once he's done with that we'll look at some other uh, uh, other types of dugout canoes on the northwest coast as well as some other Alaska native watercraft so, w without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce Donna Walk, Michael Beasley. Thank you. Glad to be here. Um, this is my first time speaking here, and I am a little nervous, but it should be okay. Uh, this first picture here is a good one to look at. Uh, what we have is a bunch of Yakutat style spruce canoes. And if you look at the pilings in the background, what's really good to note is that those are all basically hemlock. Hemlock is really, really good wood for vertical. But when it comes to horizontal, spruce is where it's at. So these canoes would never work as hemlock. Spruce is the only way to go. So that's really the, one of the most important things to uh, walk away with. Um, and I'm gonna show this um, next picture. This was our goal. Um, we did this in maybe 80, 88 in Huna, and this is a, a, a spruce-style canoe, and uh, for the proper pronunciation, please stay tuned. This is Yarrow the Great. <laughs> no, it says mute. Yark. Yark. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So over in Huna back in 87, uh, there was an elder, uh, George Dalton Sr., and before he passed, he wanted to, um, he wanted to get a carving going of a spruce-style canoe. And he got in with the Glacier uh, Bay Park Service, and he became friends with them, and they did a joint venture. And, um, let's see. Okay, so these are all the Park Service guys. And this guy here with the, um, to the left of George Dalton Sr., he was really the biggie. And he was the guy over on the right, I think his name was Jensen. Um, he was actually the park ranger. But these are the guys, this guy on the left was the funding guy from DC. And they really, really walked together with George Dalton. They just loved this project. So this was the guy that we had to work with. His name was Dave Spurdies, he was the one that uh, was our contact, and he was the assistant uh, park ranger over there. And uh, we used to eat dinners, and <clears throat> the whole project took two months, seven days a week. And it all had to be by hand in the park service. No saws, nothing. We got to use the whip saws, and that's where I learned about kerosene. Kerosene is a lubricant for the whip saw. We had a big ceremony when we got to look at the log for the first time, and it was just scary. 
must have been four and a half, five feet wide. And uh, this is the old man's son, Richard Dalton Sr. We had a big ceremony going into it, and we all had to take some ceremonial chops. I had never used a ship ads before, five inches wide. Just lucky you didn't get the toe. So this was a really kind of a real uh, sweaty day. So the first thing you do in a canoe is you want to go in there and establish the bottom. That's the most important thing. And you do all of your forming on the outside first because once you're done with the outside, you never come back to the outside. The hollowing will come next, but you got you to gotta do all of the outside first. Start with the bottom. Then you have a, a base to work from. So <clears throat> let's take the canoe and we got to cut sides. And the first thing you do is you got to cut steps and then just wedge off. And so here we have, this is Steve Brown. He, he's, he's a phenomenal carver. I was an apprentice on this project. I don't want to sound like I was the, the lead on this at all. I was just lucky to keep chasing this thing for two months. But this is Steve Brown, and then this is where we're starting to wedge off the, the sides for the front and the back. Okay, so we've taken the steps and we've kind of tapered it now. You can see how the taper, and it was just a lot of work, working the sides. And we had our uh, inspector here, George. He was always on site. Every morning, he'd take me 7 a.m., and for some reason, I had to go get these devil's clubs, um, the bark, and then one bucket of salt water, and then He'd take it and act like he was washing us down for the day, and then we'd have to put a little water in the um, spruce shavings in each corner of this every day. Okay, here, here I am working the ads and trying to get that taper down, working the outside. We ended up with a lot of chips, and you save your chips because you're going to steam this thing when you're done, and it's the fuel for it. We had a lot of kids that came out a couple times, and here is Richard Dalton, Jr. He's giving a, a talk to the kids, and Steve, he's working away, and you can see the Park Service person in the back. See that big log behind there? The next year we did another, uh, this was a 25-foot log that we're working on, and then the next year we went over to Huna and did a 24-footer with that other log. And if you had to do it again, you'd go for a smaller log. Because there's, there's a way to do it so that in your log, you kind of go like this and steam it and bring it out. So you can start with a smaller log and end up with something bigger. That's, that's the goal. I tell you, this, this old guy, he was old, but he didn't miss a trick. You know, he used to like to just love to come over, George Dalton Sr., and inspect the work. And this was like 31 years ago that we did this. So we're getting kind of close where it looks good. Kind of looks like a big whale on the side. Uh, the bottom's done. And you see all that real pretty adzing? I didn't do any of it. I just, I wasn't talented enough to do it. It was all Steve Brown. Aren't those beautiful? It, uh, it almost looks like, like welders, rows. They're just beautiful. So the, the kind of the neat thing, when you think that you're getting close to finishing the outside, then you have to do this little trick to establish the thickness of your walls once you start um, hollowing it out. So you go in there and in rows, sideways and you drill holes and then you'll put in pegs say if you want on the bottom you want that to be an inch and a half thick you would put a peg in that is a red cedar color a, an, a, a contrasting color to the spruce and then you would uh, pound that in from the outside and you run these courses and you do your whole canoe that way so that you know when you're on the inside and you're chopping away 
and all of a sudden you, you hit this six inch hole, you know at the end of that hole is where you got to stop. And so that'll help you from going through. And so Richard, that's what he's doing here. So we're going to say that we've done the outside uh, and we're just, we're, we're tired of this. We're going to go in there and start hollowing the inside. So one of the biggest things you got to worry about uh, when you're up there on the top deck, always adds towards the center. You don't ever want to be adzing and then adzing off because you can tear a piece and you can't tear the edge. Okay, it's worse than doing a pie. So adds towards the center. And then there's Steve Brown, he's up there and what he's starting to do is he's starting to chop a hole. And then he'll go chop another hole and then you wedge the piece out in between. It's a lot faster and easier than trying to make chips of the whole interior. So this is it, this is uh, the solid getting ready for the hollowing. And you can see where there's a bit, been a little bit of a hole made. You can see where we use the whip saw going across. That was a lot of work. There was a lot of bugs that summer too. Okay, now we're going to get into the hollowing. And you can actually really see, you know, you uh, uh, right beyond Steve, where it's that little solid one all the way across, you got to leave it solid until the very end. Because as you hollow this thing, the sides are going to get like a peanut. They're going to bulge out a little bit, and they're going to shudder and shake just a little bit. And you don't want this thing to thwack off, you know, piece going off. So you need that stabilizer in the middle. And if you're doing a really big canoe, you would have two of them. Now it starts getting a little tricky here, where we've done some of the wedging of the wood, and then you've got to start trying to get down on the thickness. And it's just a lot of work. I mean, it is just a lot of work. Um, a canoe is worth a lot more than a totem pole. On a canoe, you're only leaving like 15% of a log. Okay, so here, I don't know if you can see some of the pegs. Some of the little round dark spots are the pegs, but I'm trying to fine tune it here. And it was a long time on, on your knees and doing all this kind of scraping. Here's Steve Brown. Uh, we've got the interior all done and then you gotta start looking at like wind shook cracks and dealing with that kind of stuff. <coughs> we use these figure eight um, plugs. You can see what he's doing. So where the waste is on the plug, that's the way the crack goes. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to catch the crack and keep it from pulling apart. It's very common in these canoes where there can be a hundred of these plugs, even 150, you know, you just don't worry about plugs, they're nothing. I think everybody a long time ago had canoe kits, you know, and I think repair was real important. Now, before we steamed, uh, when this tree was up, we think that it got wind shook near the bottom. And even as when you knock the tree down, sometimes when you leave a hinge in between as it, as it breaks it's solid in the middle we'll call that the hinge sometimes as the tree falls it like it, it yanks it down and that's what's happened here see that hole there I mean it just it just echoes through the whole log believe it or not so Steve being the expert he is he's the king of patch and that's what's happening here and a lot of your canoes have patches it's no big deal Look at that baby. It's, it's just wonderful. 
So this canoe is still over in Glacier Bay. Uh, there's been a sighting of a black bear on there, you know. There's some marks inside, and it's, it's been there for a lot of years. Steve the expert. So this isn't one of mine, but um, it's, it's how they used to do it a long time ago. You know, um, if you go up into the river system, uh, the haynes Cluckwan area, they use cottonwood for their trees. They're a softer wood, and they're, they are more malleable. Duke. Oh, this, okay, this was over in Huna doing that second canoe. And um, there's a big story to this one. But anyway, here we are working the outside. Steve and I, it was hot, a lot of horse flies. A lot of horse flies. Okay, this is back to a Glacier Bay. We're all done, and we're getting ready for the steam. Uh, we've built our fire, and so it's, we're looking forward to a good day here. And what we did was we filled up water and then we built two fires and we did alternating stones inside. So you put those hot rocks in and it creates steam. You put a big tarp over the top. It gets like bread, convection. It's pretty amazing. Okay, I want to give you my secret right now. Um, I was on a, a big canoe project once and we were halfway through our steam and we lost our water. And what happened was the canoe running the long way, it kind of cracked. And it was just whoosh, like a sieve. It just, it all ran out. And it was like, oh no, what are we going to do? And you got to be like a MacGyver, you know, and you got to, you know, kind of scramble. And uh, I just, you know, it was like these guys I was with in Klaquan, it was like, Hey, you guys got a, uh, any uh, galvanized tubs? And I was like, oh, yeah, we can get three. And I go, okay, you two go get those three. Um, you got a dump here, right? Yeah. Um, hey, I want to go see your uh, metal pile. And I got some of these. Um, I mean, the white rocks I used, the black rocks I used, the white and black rocks I used, they all cracked. You know, I was having a terrible day with my rocks. So I got these valve covers, and they must have weighed 35, 40 pounds. So I went back to my two fires, put those back in, and we placed the three tubs inside this 40-foot uh, canoe. And um, <clears throat> what I first did was I filled up it with water. I put the hot stuff in the tubs. Then I filled it up with water, except for about two inches from the top, put the tarp on, and it got really, really hot. I did that a couple of heatings, and then I thought, well, what if I only put about a third of water in there? And so I did that, and it got nuclear hot. So the big secret is if you ever lose your water or if you're on a project where you're, somebody's going to steam a canoe, you don't really have to go through the water thing. You can use galvanized tubs, and it is just as effective as doing it this way. While we were over there, there was a, a, a group of kids. They came over, and they were gathering spruce roots over in Glacier Bay. Glacier Bay has uh, kind of sandy soil, has the most wonderful spruce roots. I mean, it is just hog heaven over there for that. And what they do is they coil it, they heat it, and then while it's still hot, they'll pull it through a notch in a, in a little um, uh, piece of wood, and then that's, that, takes, that strips off all of the outer bark. And so that's what they're doing here. And this was their leader, uh, Ernestine. Uh, she's, still, she's still doing her art and the park service. That was right at the dock there in Glacier Bay. So this is it. This is what uh, we've ended up with in uh, Huna, the second canoe. And you notice that it's winter time. So here's the story on this one. So. It snowed really hard. It was warming up. The report was we were going to get rain. And so it was like on a Friday, it's like, you know, these boards, they were like one by sixes, and they were starting to bend where there were knots. And you could just see with weight that it was going to fall. And so it was like, eh, maybe we better get it out of here. 
And so we got a bunch of high schoolers, moved it out. And what we did is we went against the school at the head of a drive. Well, it snowed really hard. It didn't rain. And so at 6 in the morning, I got a call from the guy that was doing the snow removal. And he's like, Mick, can you come down? And it's like, why? What's going on? Oh, just, just come down. So what happened was we had our canoe against the wall. And he was backing up and he backed into it and it stripped it right out just shattered the thing um, they put it back together but it never it never got back to its fullness but it, it's still over in huna and, and it makes for a good story so this was it the uh this is the huna one the one that got all broke up i adds my knee on this project i was up in the bow are these your added photos? Yeah. yeah, they're nice. So they had a, um, a party for this, a dedication after the Huna. Tri uh, this is for the Huna one, I believe, the Huna canoe, and they did it over there. Nice ceremony. There's Jesse Dalton. A lot of these folks are all uh, past now. This is over in Glacier Bay. This lady here with the yellow around her, the elder, that's George Dalton's wife, Jessie. And some of the daughters standing up behind. There's always a good singer. So. So is this the Glacier Bay canoe? Yeah, that's the Glacier Bay one arriving in Huna. Oh, how nice. This really bolstered the uh, Dalton family. It was really a, a big, they're a big family from Huna. And so um, they all had a real interest in this. The roads are paved now. We're happy to report. That's cool, We've got a park service guy in there. Okay, there's the two of them. Steve, these are good. That was quite a dedicating day. Hey, what's happening here? Oh, okay, okay. From from a, uh, it almost looked like a big crack, and it's like, what? Thank you, Yaro. Thank you. <laughs> Old man Dalton with all the regalia. That's his wife in the back there, going the other way. All Daltons back there. This was a really big day for them. It, it was fun to be part of this project. Ernie Hillman over there. Amy Marvin, second one in on from the left. Nice hats. Cyril George, my my mom's uh, sister Judy was married to him. Isn't that pretty? Those are all Daltons. They did their own paddles just for this. Um, their paddles were a little bit more pointed than everyone else's. You can see it. See, the thing about paddles, they're as, as well as a utensil, they're a weapon. So it's nice to have a good point. Hey, you know what? I never did get to go out in the Glacier Bay canoe for a ride. I never did. Um, everybody was using it so much. Yeah. So a lot of these old pictures, you see them where they they do the work right on the ground. There's Klukwan pictures; they do them right on the ground. Six knot ladies. This is a great one. Okay, this is one of mine, right? Yeah, that's a yak attack. 
This is the Yakutat one that uh, my brother was working on at Centennial Hall. Um, we still have this out in the yard. It, it came out pretty good. Uh, the tendency for uh, today is that most carvers don't carve their canoes thin enough. You always have a tendency to leave them, leave them too thick. They don't steam as nice, um, but it's just the way it is. So here's the one Rick made. Um, it turned out okay. You know, a little bit tippy, or as the books say, a little cranky. That's North Douglas. Okay, so this one here, I wanted to make a fiberglass canoe, and this was my first attempt. And I started it in Seattle. I got booted out of a, a, a rental, you know, for, for garages, and uh, they didn't like the smell. And so I ended up putting it on the barge, bringing it to Alaska. And uh, it was my, really my first attempt at trying to understand how to uh, make one. Um, let's go back. Well, anyway, that other one, I got to tell you, I made it and I did it in fiberglass and I took it out North Douglas and it was like a Coke can. It was so tippy, like it took a life of its own. And I brought it back in and I cut it in half and I took it right to the dump. <laughs> I, you know, I had so much dreams for it, but it just, Function-wise, it wasn't there. So the next attempt was um, I took a course over to Marine Tech. And on the computer, we designed out a Clinkett-style canoe. And this here is the, uh, what we did would be like taking a, um, a canoe and cutting it down the middle of the long way. And then you just lay it on its side. And then you take two impressions of that. And you turn one around, and you have a mold. And it was uh, a 30-footer, five and a half feet wide. It'll hold 13 people. Every 600 pounds, it'll go down one inch. It can take a, uh, it'll probably take a Toyota. Toyota. Um, so anyway, that was made out of, uh, this is the, the plug, what we call the plug. Oops. There's the beast. So, <clears throat> Once I had my mold, I'll tell you what I did. I, was, I took it over to Marine Tech, and I used to go out to the um, halfway house, and I'd hire four or five workers, sand all day long. <laughs> so I used a lot of halfway house workers. And so uh, once we made the mold, this is one of those canoes. And they're real stable. This one here got away and got thrashed on the rocks, and it was recovered later, and uh, it's refurbished now. Um, okay, at this point, I want to um, step away and then show the, um, I want to show a cross section of this canoe. So this. So this. Yeah. So this here is the fiberglass uh, canoe, a little cross section cut of it. And so I just kind of want to show you what a, like a modern day layup is. So we have the fiberglass on the outside, and then we have a foam core so that uh, it'll, you know, help it uh, float a little better. So this is it, and uh, there's seven of these, and they're, they're really tough. Um, if you see all the um, regattas with canoes, wherever my canoes are, there's more people standing really tall because they're real stable. They're not a tippy canoe. You can actually empty, you can stand up here, two men on the bow and, you know, rock it, and they don't go over. So they're pretty good, but it takes a drum of resin, a roll of roven woven, and they're pretty heavy. But we learn about um, inertia. And weight in a boat really makes it go through the water really, really well. Let's see. Uh, here we have people getting ready to get kind of crazy in these uh, fiberglass canoes. 
it's pretty incredible how um, crazy everybody gets. We've had some really good races, you know, like uh, like right at the finish line, you get two canoes that are kind of uh, going like that and see who's going to get in first. And then there'll be a third one plow right through the middle and they take it. Men and women. Okay, so here's kind of a picturesque of uh, three of those canoes. Okay, I think that's it for the... Okay, and so what I want to show now... Uh, when I lived in Huna, this guy gave me this, uh, and it's uh, from Tenneke. He got it out of the uh, bushes over there. And it's the beginning of a, a canoe. See the inside? And again, you can tell just by looking at the wood that it's made out of spruce. Um, there's a little bit of green paint in here. I've had it analyzed. It's modern day. So it's kind of interesting. Here's my garage sale special. These are Yakutat style canoes. This little point in the front, that's so it'll hit the ice when they're going through the ice. They were stacked like this in Douglas, $15. I said I'll take them. See, when I was in high school, along with a couple others here, um, there was a guy that lived up on 10th Street, Frank Dick. He was from Yakutat. He was uh, probably 75, 80 at the time. These are his. But he was, uh, uh, he always made these uh, uh, Yakutat style canoes. Thank you very much, Mick. Could we have a round of applause? <laughs> so um, <clears throat> thank you everyone. Um, uh, and Mick, thank you for such a great illustration of how uh, Northwest Coast dugout canoes are made and there it's the same basic process <clears throat> regardless of of which type of canoe uh, you're making and there's probably about a dozen or 15 different types of dugout canoes from the uh, Northwest Coast starting uh, if you go all the way down to the Oregon coast up to Yakutat that's what anthropologists refer to as the Northwest Coast so there's a lot of regional styles of these and I wanted to uh, show you some of those styles and talk to you a little bit about some of the features of them but uh, they're really um, an amazing um, amazingly beautiful and functional um, means of transportation it's it's as if uh, you would travel from place to place in a in a sculpture basically because of the the form uh, the, of the canoe they're really uh, aesthetically beautiful and the design however is fine-tuned over centuries of development to um, to deal with the kind of conditions that you have on the water in southeast Alaska and the northwest coast so I'll go to the next something's not working here Mm -hmm. Could I make a comment? Sure. Yeah, go right ahead. So one of the things to uh, think about is that the Yakutat style, the Clinkett uh, spruce canoe, they're all a single piece. Now these canoes here, they have an added bow and stern. That's what makes them so ocean going uh, because they're upswept. But they don't get that out of a single log. They're, they're adding it. And so that's real important that you know that. So uh, from time to time uh, on the Northwest Coast, as people are roaming around in the woods, they come on an old uh, abandoned dugout canoe. And this is one, I believe, from uh, on Prince of Wales Island. But they're, they find them in various places. And some of them are, are 100 years old or more and they're barely recognizable as canoes but they still um, they still are sitting out there and 
you know, no one really knows the reason they were never completed. Maybe they uh, got pretty far along in the project and found that there was some damage that they just weren't able to repair or something else interrupted that process. But there are a few of those still around in the woods and probably some waiting to be discovered. So uh, uh, canoes, uh, Northwest Coast dugout canoes are some of the most sophisticated uh, indigenous watercraft in North America. And um, if you go to the very far southern end of the Northwest Coast in Northern California, uh, they have a type of canoe that's actually made with planks and they sew the planks together like a, um, a European style watercraft. But uh, from, from the southern Oregon on up to Alaska, wherever cedar and spruce trees grow, the uh, name of the game was doing a dugout. And the antiquity of these is, is really not, not known. It's certain that they, um, that they were developed over thousands of years and uh, entered into some of the stories, uh, uh, origin stories of the Haida people, for instance. This is a sculpture by Bill Reed uh, called the, the uh, this is either the jade or the black canoe. I can't remember, there's two of them. Uh, one is uh, at the uh, Canadian Embassy in Washington, D.C., and the others in the Vancouver, B.C. International Airport. Amazing, they're probably 15 feet tall. The top of the chief's hat is 15 feet off the ground, so they're massive. And they feature uh, uh, these supernatural characters from Haida stories in a, in a dugout canoe form. So uh, certainly uh, the first people to come to the Northwest Coast had these and <clears throat> the sophistication of the watercraft as well as the, the navigational um, prowess that the people have uh, really give credence to the archaeologists' view that maybe the first people to come to the coast were traveling by canoe. They weren't waiting for an ice-free corridor to open up through North America. They were hopping from one ice-free refuge along the coast to the next when glaciers still covered parts of the coast. And the, the canoe uh, is, is something that's ingrained in, in uh, Northwest Coast culture. The kids uh, learn about canoes by playing with models. This is at uh, Taku Harbor. Um, little kids playing with a, a, playing with a full-size canoe with a model canoe. <clears throat> and, uh, and certainly over time, the dugout canoe is one of the, the symbols of Northwest Coast Native peoples. And, uh, this is a painting uh, by Bill Holm that I'm proud to say is in the State Museum's collection, and it's on dis hanging in the governor's house right now. It's on loan to them, but it's a beautiful example of several of the northern Northwest Coast styles of canoes. This is a painting by Mark Myers. It's also now in our collection, showing uh, the two ships that came to southeast Alaska uh, uh, on the Vancouver expedition meeting a Haida chief in the Craig area uh, and they're using uh, several types of uh, dugout canoes including the big ones they call the head canoe and in in uh, uh, this is not a a uh, dead art it's it's alive and well and it's there's been a renaissance of carving these canoes in the past 30 plus years uh, and the knowledge uh, of how to make these has been kept alive by elders in, of all the different tribes. George Dalton that uh, Mick was talking about, he, as a boy, he saw canoes being carved. And I'm, I'm not sure if he actually ever made them himself. Yeah, he. so he participated in that in a, as a boy. And for decades to follow, even though people had, were no longer making those canoes, he kept the knowledge alive and just in time to pass uh, some of his knowledge on to the next generation of carvers. And we're all indebted to those uh, early to mid 20th century uh, old timers who kept the knowledge of the art form and canoe building alive to uh, to be able to participate in the resurgence of canoe carving. 
So uh, on the northwest coast, there's about a dozen major rivers that cut uh, through the coastal range of mountains from the interior to the coast. And those uh, rivers uh, were uh, trade routes. And so they had to have a type of canoe that would be able to withstand being knocked against rocks and operating in swift water. And so there was a style of dugout that all the tribes along those uh, rivers used to be able to go uh, back and forth uh, to trade with the interior people. And those canoes were not like the ones Mick was talking about that that would be spread with steam and you'd make the bottom an inch and a half thick and the sides maybe a three quarters of an inch. That would be too fragile probably for being drug over rocks and running up against uh, rocks in swift water. So the, the river canoes were fairly thick-sided uh, to with, be able to withstand that kind of pounding. But the canoes uh, used on the coast had to be much more seaworthy than that. They had to deal with large waves and the canoe designers over a long period of time probably refined their uh, technique and design of making the canoes to a very high level. These are some New Chalnuth style canoes from west coast of Vancouver Island and the Macaw people who live on the Olympic Peninsula going through some heavier seas. And the, the canoe uh, hull uh, uh, on a lot of the, the canoes used on the open ocean had a, a special cross section so right at the top it flares out. So if you're going into a wave it will tend to uh, uh, be pushed up above the wave and if there is any splashes it whether, rather than going up and coming in it gets thrown away and thrown outward from the canoe. This is another uh, a macaw style canoe, New Chalnuth canoe from the west coast of Vancouver Island. So let's uh, starting in the south I wanted to show you some of the major types of dugout canoes. This is one uh, type used on the Columbia River by the Chinook people. Their um, canoe building uh, seems to have um, gone away by the mid 1800s. So uh, some of the uh, accounts by some of the European and American uh, expeditions that came to the Columbia River gives us uh, some important details about what their canoes were like. And there are a few models too, and this is the best of the Columbia River models still in existence. This one's in the um, American Museum of Natural History, but it has these carved uh, 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 figures, a bird on the bow and a bear, it looks like, clinging to the stern. And going a little bit further north to P the Puget Sound area, the Coast Salish people have a uh, this style of canoe, and these are uh, mostly used in the sheltered waters of Puget Sound, so they didn't have to withstand uh, open ocean conditions as much. But these, uh, a lot of these canoes from the southern part of the coast were black on the outside and red on the inside. The black was from scorching uh, the outside of the hull to get rid of slivers, and then they'd oil over the top of it with seal oil or whatever oil they happened to have. And the inside was painted with red ochre. So uh, again, talking about the Vancouver Island style, the these ranged in size from maybe 10 to 12 foot up to, well, probably 60 feet or so. Smaller canoes were used by smaller groups of people for uh, fishing and harvesting. Here's a mother and daughter team probably out from collecting, picking berries. The This type of canoe is distinctive in that it has what looks kind of like a wolf's head at the bow, but uh, that is probably not what it actually is. It's a coincidental form. Let me click onto my pointer here. Um, this, this area looks like ears, but it's actually just the result of having a, a depression carved in it, and that's so that your harpoon uh, would rest in that spot and not roll off the side. And this, uh, the New Chalnuth elders call this a handle and it's just something useful when you're picking up a canoe and bringing it on shore it gives you something convenient to hang on to 
And these canoes are very different from other canoes on the coast because this, uh, you can see this seam right here, the bow piece and the stern piece that rises up quite a ways from the rest of the canoe is, is actually a separate piece of wood. And th what that does is it allows you to make two canoes from the base of one tree because you're not, you're not going past the center of the tree. And that's allowed because you're putting on these separate pieces to uh, on the bow and stern. And you can even use a cedar log that has a rotted middle because that, that bow piece acts as a patch. So it gives you just that much less to hollow out when you get to that part of the process if the tree's already partly rotted in the inside. And many of the red cedar trees are rotted that way. This is a pretty amazing photo from the turn of the last century of, uh, of four New Chalnuth canoes being made from the base of one giant red cedar log. You can see the stump there in the background. So they felled that tree and they split, split it down the middle and they're carving four, it looks like 15 or 18 foot canoes from that one log. And uh, here's a couple other photos. This, uh, this is a full-size canoe up on top. The one down here is a model. And there are a few models that have a really intriguing feature, uh, sometimes painted on the inside of the gunnel and sometimes on the outside like this one. See this squiggly line here is a really interesting uh, decorative feature. And uh, there's an anthropologist called Wilson Duff, and he wrote a... a paper on the relationship between the New Chalnuth style canoes and the Umiaks used by the uh, Inupiaq people and Yupik people uh, for hunting whales. And uh, both the New Chalnuth and the Inupiaq actively go into the ocean to hunt whales and they have a very similar process for doing that. And Wilson Duff went so far as to suggest that the New Chalnuth dugout canoe is actually a, a wooden umiak, that the shape of the hull and some of the features are very, very similar. And he even said that this wavy line here is an exact representation of the lashing on the inside of the umiak where you take the skin covering and you go over the gunnel and then you lace it down and it makes this wavy line. So I don't know if there's any truth to that, and, and I don't know how to explain what cultural connection there would be between those two people living over a thousand miles apart, but maybe there's something in, in the ancient history that uh, might explain that connection. So this is the largest New Chinese style canoe ever constructed, about 60 feet long. So they do range quite a bit in, in size. And just to give you a sense of the, how excellent these canoes are, there was actually a, 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 a New Chalnuth dugout canoe that was purchased by uh, Captain Voss, who f fitted it with a small cabin and three masts, and he sailed it nearly around the world. And this, is, this shows his route. So he started in Victoria, went across the Pacific, <coughs> across the Indian Ocean and around the Horn of Africa to South America and then back up to London. <coughs> Excuse me. So he didn't quite... When? This was, uh, I'm thinking, 1920s. There's a, a book on it by Captain Voss, John Voss. It's one of the, uh, to this day, it's one of the epic uh, small craft journeys, and he he became the ex, an expert in the use of the sea anchor to be able to do this because he had to make so many landings through surf in a small boat that he deployed sea anchors to be able to time his uh, descent onto the beach between breakers and he was able to somehow do this. And there's actually, they still study his techniques if you're learning how to navigate a small boat. <clears throat> Excuse me, but anyway, quite an impressive feat for a Northwest Coast dugout canoe. And each of the tribes have their own traditions and uh, about telling uh, the history of their lineages and clans using masks and other ceremonial 
devices. And this is a, a carver named Young Doctor of the uh, Macaw people. Uh, in order to dramatize the story, he developed a, uh, a miniature dugout canoe with puppets inside, and the puppets could move. And this was brought out in a, in a ceremony. This is the, the I believe it's the, car, the man sitting behind there is the carver. So uh, another type of canoe, we're working our way from south to north, and another type of canoe is called the Munka, and it's considered a, a war canoe because of the large flat piece at the bow, this, this part here. <coughs> Excuse me, it broadens out to three or four feet wide, and the, the usual explanation for these in the literature, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but it was thought of as a canoe that you would use if you were going to war and landing your canoe <clears throat> with incoming fire from people on shore shooting arrows at you. And this bow piece was so wide because that would deflect some of the, the arrows from, from hitting the occupants. Now there, there's a few uh, drawings by European visitors to the coast in the <clears throat> the late 1700s or early 1800s, and there's a few models too. And there's a this is actually a feast dish made in the form of one of those Munka canoes. And Bill Holmes painting Raven Warrior showing warriors uh, using one of these uh, type of canoes. And they seem to have been both used on the southern coast as well as the northern end. So let's look at a couple of the northern uh, Northwest Coast canoes. Additionally, we have in the back of Bill Holmes' painting, there is a head canoe with a large flat panel that uh, invited being covered with form line design. And then in the foreground, a more of a classic later style, read 19th century style um, Klingit canoe. <clears throat> and these, uh, these do show up in <clears throat> Excuse me. In uh, oh, thank you. Excuse me. These show up in drawings by some of the visitors. Uh, this one is uh, a backstrom from the late 1700s in the Queen Charlotte Islands, Haida Gwaii. And these folks are uh, these women are paddling a, a small head canoe, but they're Many of these illustrators didn't realize that uh, the bow was actually the the end with the large flat panel. So they have the paddlers here paddling it backwards. And this is a engraving from the La Perouse expedition that came to Southeast Alaska in the late 1700s. This is a, a fish camp at uh, uh, port de France, the port of France, which is near Yakutat, and on the beach there on the right hand side is a head canoe. And this one actually seems to have a hole that's uh, cut in the side, which uh, some <clears throat> some people have wondered, well, why is this, why did this type of canoe disappear in the 1700s? And some people have thought that maybe it's because in a crosswind, these would be very hard to manage. So by putting a hole in there, it might defeat some of the effect that the crosswind would have. In addition to these European drawings, there's also representations of head canoes that show up in artwork from the northern northwest coast. And this is, these are paintings <clears throat> on the inside of a bentwood bowl from Klingit country, and this shows a head canoe being paddled. And there's also an old mask that uh, we think is from the Taku Klingit. The original of the mask shown here is uh, in a winter or a case and draper photo of the inside of a curio shop in Juneau. And in that photo, between the ears of this creature, whatever it is, maybe a wolf or bear, <clears throat> is a fin that resembles a uh, head canoe. And this is Steve Brown's uh, version of that, of that taku uh, headdress that has a head canoe between the ears. 
And even in Chilkat weaving, there's representations of the, this early style canoe. This is a shaman's apron that shows a, 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 a head canoe with holes in the bow and stern uh, being uh, occupied and traveling. But mostly we have models to go by. There's probably several dozen head canoe models that are in mostly in European institutions. They're very rare. <clears throat> they were made as uh, curios for some of the first fur traders to come to the Northwest Coast. And uh, they, the, the sailors couldn't bring home full-size canoes, but they really, they were sailors and they immediately recognized the, the value of these canoes they saw on the Northwest Coast, so they took models back with them. And so we get a, a really good idea of how the head canoes were made by looking at the models, even though the models are, are usually shorter than they would be if they were stretched out as a full-size canoe, but it gives you a pretty good, pretty good idea and shows you how much of the length of the canoe is involved in those flat fins. Here's a couple other models. A lot of people haven't seen Northern Northwest Coast form line with yellow in it, but uh, <clears throat> it does. It is something that shows up every once in a while. And here's a couple more. This one's at the British Museum. Really, a beautiful large model. It's probably four and a half feet long. And this one at the bottom. Is one of the earliest ones I've ever seen. It's in the it was collected by the Malaspina expedition. That was a Spanish expedition in 1791. And that's in Madrid in the Museo de America. So there's a, there's at least one uh, old head canoe that's uh, still out in the woods. This one is uh, on Haida Gwaii, and it's probably would have been about. Uh, 40 feet long or so. It, it was never never hollowed out. The outer, like Mick was saying, he shaped the outside first, and this is just the outside. They never got around to hollowing it out, and it's just been sitting out in the woods for 150 years or so. <clears throat> this is a, a canoe, I think you, this is the one you steamed using those um, the uh, cylinder, what was it, the cylinder covers? Yeah, tubs. Yeah. Galvanized tubs. Galvanized tubs. This is a, a modern head canoe that uh, is uh, uh, owned by the, uh, the uh, uh, Chilkat Indian Village in Klukwan, and they, they take it out from time to time, but it's really cool. So this is the uh, kind of the Cadillac of the northern northwest coast. This is the, the typical 19th and early 20th style dug out and there's there's record of several uh, really large ones that survived into the uh, early 20th century. This is the bear canoe uh, from the Nanyai of Wrangell that's in the Smithsonian now. <clears throat> and this is another large one. This is, one is, uh, I think it was made by the Hiltzuk and painted by the Haida, <clears throat> but it's in the American Museum of Natural History uh, now, so there are a couple of these these monster canoes around, and they're really amazing to look at. But this was uh, canoes of this type would have ranged from 15 feet or 20 feet or so on up to the largest size log available. This is a really neat photo that came to light recently of uh, people Sitka Kaguantans going to a potlatch in Klukwan wearing their best ceremonial at U and uh, they're both paddling that canoe and, and you can see a line, a tow line going off of the bow. So they're coming into the village for a kuik. But canoes also were the everyday uh, all-purpose station wagon for general travel and fishing and hunting and anything else. This would be about a 30-foot one. It's being used for uh, gill netting at Sitka. And here's a, a couple of, you can see the, the classic northern style canoes here. Oh, I, there we go. 
right in the, I don't know if my, my pointer doesn't seem to be showing up anymore. Let's see. Nope. So anyway, the canoes there in the background are the northern style. The one in the foreground is one of the spruce canoes that Mick told us about. What's going on? Oh, that's charming. It says it, it is not, PowerPoint is not responding. So stand by for a station break. Okay. Sorry about this. It's coming up. Yeah, it is. I'm trying to get back to where I was. You can see all the slides. Okay. I think it's Yeah, here. Okay, and I just need to Size is right down there next to the slider bar. There? Uh, all the way to the oh. right. Right there, yep. Give me just a second. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. So this is on the beach at Sitka with the with uh, probably ten or so different dugouts there being pulled up in front of the clan houses. There's another shot of uh, Mick and Steve's beautiful spruce canoe at Huna. So he mentioned the Yakutat style. That's this kind, and it, it's uh, distinctive in that it has a, uh, a triangular cutwater in the bow. That's a, on the left of these, it sticks out, and that's what <clears throat> Mick was saying was for breaking the crust of ice on, that forms on the surface of the salt water, so you're not going to damage that thin hull with, uh, with sharp pieces of ice. There are quite a few models of these, and you know, one of the function of these is uh, of that of that cut water uh, may also have something to do with speed and stability, and also the efficiency of taking a a haul through water. And it's a feature that you see on many uh, modern ships: this projecting uh, bulb in the bow just below the waterline, and that increases speed, efficiency, and stability of of the craft and gives additional buoyancy to the bow to help it ride up over if a big wave hits the bow on it will tend to make the bow pop up <clears throat> more quickly and keep more water from getting in. So on the Chilkat River uh, they make a special, uh, Mick also mentioned that the cottonwood dugouts there uh, for use on the river. Here they are uh, dipping for hooligans out of the Chilkat River. And this is Old Man Katzik, I believe, carving a dugout there. And they've recently revived uh, the making of these there at Clock One. And this, do you know who carved this one? No. Uh, so it's it's a beauty though, and, and made out of cottonwood. Maybe Archie Claney. <clears throat> so um, that that sort of concludes going through the from south to north the major types of canoes and I wanted to talk about a few other features of canoes and one of them is is propulsion starting with sails and and from all indications sails were not something that was just copied when the first sailing ships from Europe showed up they it's obvious that that wind could help propel a dugout canoe and so they they traditionally made sails out of cedar bark plated mats of cedar bark and this is a modern reconstruction of a cedar bark sail and judging from old photos some of these canoes had two or one two or three masts and they had several different ways of rigging them and some of these uh, they actually have fitted a rudder onto the back to the stern of the canoe to help with steering. And these couldn't tack much. They could run with the wind and maybe get a little bit of an angle on it, but you wouldn't really want to try to, without having a center board like a, a, sa a sailboat, you really couldn't heel over too much with these. But it would certainly be a big help if the wind conditions were right. Here's another 
type of rig. This is on the Taku River. So Mick mentioned the paddles. Uh, most of the nor Northwest Coast paddles are pointed on the ends, and the New Chanuth paddles for sea otter hunting were especially pointed. And these are the tips of these are, uh, you know, maybe a half an inch at thick at the thickest part. They really were very fragile. And this is actually because of the, it wasn't for, uh, really for paddling the canoe, it was more for stealth. They, try, they were trying to get very close to animals like sea otters and seals that were uh, very skittish. And any, even a drip of water off the end of your paddle would be enough to make them take flight. So they designed these paddles so they never have to take them out of the water. They would drag that point in the water, then take their next stroke. So they would never end up dripping water off the paddle into the ocean. But inevitably, when you're in a canoe that has some cracks, a few cracks in it and splashing, you're going to get water in there. And they even have specialized forms of uh, balers. The one on top is made out of uh, folded cedar bark. And the one on the bottom carved out of wood. And uh, uh, one of my favorite accessories for canoes is a tackle box, a bent wood tackle box that's has the kerf at an angle so you, it would fit in the bow of the canoe in a place where not much else is really going to fit, but it uses that extra space up front by having a really nice uh, V-shaped tackle box. As far as decoration, uh, many of the canoes were painted with a painting along the full sides, like the one on top that's a Kwakwakiwak dugout. The one on the bottom is a Klingit uh, or Haida possibly um, canoe model with beautiful form line painting on the ends. And then some of them had three-dimensional sculptures attached to them like this Kwakwakiwak canoe with a, a Thunderbird dancer in the bow. And here's a photo of one. I, this, this canoe prow figure was up on the top of a Klingit uh, canoe and I, I think it might be in the Smithsonian now, but it had this humanoid figure pointing. We don't know the story, or at least I don't know the story of that, but it is part of clan history. Hey, Steve? Yes. That last uh, picture, where, where do you, what do you suppose kind of wood they got for that? I have no idea. I've seen a, a, a photo of it um, in modern times and it's the body is painted red. So it doesn't really give much of a clue as to what kind of wood. Well, I, I think what I meant was, um, did it come off a stump? No, those are limbs, right, for the arms and oh, stuff? Oh, right. hmm. yeah, they must be attached. I mean, it's separate pieces that are attached onto the main part, but I, I haven't seen it in person, so I don't know. It's beautiful. Yeah. This is one uh, that's at the University of Pennsylvania Museum. That's Her Herman Davis there behind it. And I believe this is from his clan. And it's said to represent the Kushtaka. And this is a really amazing one from Cluck One that's now in the Field Museum in Chicago of a, of a owl or some other bird of prey that's partly in humanoid form. It has a humanoid face. And the body is here and he's got the talons of a bird, but he also has a set, uh, his arms and humanoid hands that are holding the wings. It's a pretty amazing piece. So uh, the, I wanted to tell briefly the story of another, probably the most famous canoe prow figure in existence now, the beaver canoe prow figure from Angoon. And this was discovered about 15 years ago by accident when a a delegation of clan leaders <clears throat> went to New York to the American Museum of Natural History to look at artifacts uh, uh, for potential repatriation under the repatriation law. And Harold Jacobs, who was one of the leaders of the group, was going down the aisles. And whenever he goes to a museum, he has to see the things that they don't know where they're from because you just never know what might be there. And he was going down an aisle. This is Harold's head right here. He's looking at something else, but on this aisle, he saw this head sticking out of one of the shelves, and he, he said to himself, well, I've seen that somewhere before, but he didn't immediately 
remember exactly where and he went on down the aisle and then he went back and looked at that and then he suddenly realized where he had seen it. This is a Sobolev photo taken from Angoon um, prior to the bombardment of 1882 and it says beaver canoe on the bottom and it turns out that this canoe uh, was one of the reasons why Angoon survived after the bombardment because uh, as you recall it was this time of year when the bombardment happened and it burned most of the, the food that the community had put up during the summer and it, uh, that, with that food supply gone, they were destitute and in desperate uh, jeopardy of uh, starvation. But uh, miraculously, the beaver canoe had been out uh, fishing at the time of the bombardment, and even though the sailors had landed and had burned the canoes that were on the beach there, they missed this one. And because of that, the entire community was able to harvest enough food that during the winter right after uh, the bombardment that they survived. And so for the whole community, the beaver canoe became kind of like a crest object for a clan, but it really was significant to the whole community, regardless of the clan. And so uh, this is the picture of the elders that were in New York at that time, and they were all amazed at uh, what had taken place and the kind of miracle that happened. And they were pointing out how uh, the artifacts themselves decide when it's time to reveal themselves to people and to, it's almost as if it was asking to come back. And so that became the basis of a repatriation claim. And within about six or seven months, the beaver canoe was back in Angoon. This is uh, the canoe prow figure being carried off of the, uh, one of the, the catamarans to meet the, the people of the village and they had a big welcome ceremony for it. So, um, and these are, these are some of yours. Yeah, so the um, dugout canoes and uh, watercraft based on dugout canoes have really proliferated in the, the last 20 years or so along the Northwest Coast and they have elaborate uh, gatherings every summer the, uh, that happen usually down in the lower 48 and in British Columbia. I don't think any have happened here, but they call it the Paddle to Seattle or the Paddle to Nia Bay. So every year there's probably, I would say a hundred at least of the canoes are now being actively used every year by Alaska Natives and First Nations people. Uh, so just to shift gears in the last couple of minutes here, I just wanted to make mention of a few of the other uh, uh, watercraft traditions of Alaska Natives, uh, starting with uh, the Athabascan people of the interior and some of their relatives make beautiful canoes made of uh, birch bark uh, sewn over a, a framework. This man is, is repairing them and these are, uh, because of the nature of the material, they're, they're somewhat fragile and they have to be mended quite a bit. It's something that uh, they would have to keep up with all the time in order to keep their canoes afloat. And they were used uh, for all sorts of purposes. Here's one that's being used to tend a fish trap. And some people on a journey, the man in the back is pulling with two sticks. And the other men have paddles, as you can see. Even hunting, here's a uh, Athabascan man with a copper dagger. Uh, they wait for the caribou to cross the river and at that time they can paddle out there and, and uh, take some. If you're wondering about how fragile and, and delicate the canoes, the birch bark canoes are, this gives you an idea of how tough they actually are. This is a ferry made of two birch bark canoes and they're, I don't know if that's a Model A or a Model T, but uh, and the library has preserved several of these pictures of loading the canoe. It doesn't show any of, of the aftermath. So I, I don't know if, if they managed to get across there, but it, you know, they, they were very capable watercraft in spite of being made out of uh, bark. It's very strong. <clears throat> so uh, one of the, uh, uh, Alaska is famous around the world for their uh, kayaks, including the Aleut or Unangak kayak, which is many 
kayak experts really consider to be one of the greatest watercraft of any culture of any time period. This is a uh, an Inangik man uh, uh, paddling up to a herd of sea lions. And, and kayaks are, uh, in addition a, to be a hunting tool, they are used for general transportation and even to take your family from one place to another, you would, the, the man would uh, send his wife and kids into the body of the kayak and they'd lay out in there while he paddled. <clears throat> and some of the elders uh, that are around today remember being ferried about in a, in a kayak like that and they remember how beautiful it was with the sun coming through the skin and the, the water making a beautiful sound as it hit the, uh, the skin covering and uh, well, everything was kind of uh, uh, covered in a am beautiful amber light. And this unfortunately is not from Alaska, it's from Greenland and across the, um, the circumpolar North Asia as well as North America and Greenland, they, they have their own style of kayaks. And I'm sure kayaks like this were used in Alaska, but it just shows that the kids were brought up with these and, and by the time they were, were adults, they were real experts in how to maneuver in these kayaks. So I mentioned the Aleut or Unangik kayak, and this is a, a Russian illustration of one from the 1700s, one of the first, uh, first European depictions of, of a kayak from Alaska. And this shows on this end how it's got the split bow. Again, this is probably a, um, a technique to add buoyancy to the bow and to increase the efficiency and stability of the of the narrow craft because <clears throat> the, the the greater the length of the hull under the water line the more stable it is and that's why you can see pictures of of uh, dugout canoes in the amazon and they're maybe about a foot and a half wide and 40 feet long and there's somebody standing up in one and you think well how can how can that possibly happen but the longer it is the more stable and uh, Father Venominov, who was a, a Russian Orthodox missionary to Alaska, he traveled a lot by, by Darka. That was the Russian's name for kayak. And uh, he, uh, he said that, uh, that these watercraft, uh, when they went through the water, they wiggled like a fish. They had flexibility built into it because not all of those, those wooden features were anchored solidly to each other. There were certain ones that they put bone and ivory inserts in there so they would ride over each other. Depending on how the waves were coming, that could either add speed or it could add resilience. So if a wave came, instead of breaking, the whole thing would flex and then snap back into position. So really, really in, an ingenious feature. And uh, 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 kayaks, and their paddlers were, uh, you could think of them as being hunting machines. They, they were all part of a, a set of technology used for hunting sea mammals and birds and other things that swam on or under the water or flew over the water. And the, the kayakers would have uh, a th throwing boards like this that they could fling a variety of types of harpoons, and they also had bolas that could be used for, for uh, uh, hunting birds that flew across. And they have uh, this, they wore, uh, the, the Unangik people had these elaborate bentwood hunting hats to please the spirits of the animals that they were hunting, to show respect for their, their gift of life. And kayaks were um, used in flotillas, like this is a, a photo of a group of uh, Aleut kayaks. And the, the kayaks themselves, dating back to the 18th and 19th century, are fairly rare now. And uh, I happened to cross one once when I went to the Seward House in Auburn, New York. Uh, that was the residence of Secretary of State Seward. And in 1869, he traveled to Alaska. This was after he was out of office he came up here to see what the country was like firsthand. And he brought back a small collection of uh, Alaska Native artifacts, including a Aleutian kayak, 
which is that long skinny thing hanging in the rafters of his carriage house. That was once a kayak, but because of the heat in the carriage house, the, the skin shrank so much that it collapsed the frame inside, and it's like a, a tight bundle of sticks now. <laughs> but originally it was a, a two cockpit uh, Aleut uh, kayak, and the paddle is, the double paddle is hanging right above it and still in beautiful shape. Uh, there's a little story I wanted to mention about this Aleut kayak that um, my wife and I were in San Diego and we were looking at um, uh, Klingit artifacts at the San Diego Museum of Man and in their processing area I happened to notice this beautiful Aleut kayak uh, in storage and I asked them about it and they said that it's never been on exhibit as far as they knew and I asked them if they would like... Uh, would ever entertain bringing it back to Alaska because they're so rare here. And they said, sure. So when we had this SLAM project and had money associated with it to get get things like this on loan, we asked them and they agreed to, um, to send it up to us on long-term loan. This is after it arrived. It's uh, being worked on. The mounts are being made for it here and it's now out on exhibit in the gallery. Just a beautiful example. Here's a photo of another style of Alaskan kayaks. There's about 15 styles of uh, Alaskan kayaks. And they too are sometimes depicted in ceremonies. This is a dance ornament in the form of a Hooper Bay style kayak that has a large hole in the bow. So finally, the Umiaks, of course, are a very famous, another famous type of Alaska native watercraft and these uh, ranged in size from 30, 30 feet or so up to uh, maybe 50 feet. The larger ones used were used for trading expeditions across the Bering Strait from Alaska to Siberia. This is a an Umiak loaded for trade with a sail up getting ready to leave uh, I believe it was Nome. And, that, and umiaks are sometimes uh, have to be transported over ice or land. And here's a photo of a dog team hitched up to an umiak that has a flag flying. So that's uh, probably an umiak that had just come back from a successful whale hunt. And uh, when in camp, the umiak uh, paddlers could use the vessel as a shelter. Here's one turned up on its side and they could camp there and use it as a windbreak. And here's one used as a ceremonial structure. So finally, uh, an, an, a, an old kind of uh, Alaska Native watercraft has recently reemerged based on uh, the research of Sven Hawkinson, who was previously with the Aleutic Museum in Kodiak, and he's now at the Burke Museum in Seattle. And at the Burke, they have a model Angyak, which is the Sugpiak version of an open skin boat like an Umiak. It's very distinctive though, and it's got this uh, bulgy bow, again, probably to add buoyancy. And so Sven studied the existing models of this, the one at the Burke, and then there's several others in European collections, and decided it was time to bring back that style. And he built one in, in Seattle and also uh, built some in, in uh, Alutic country. And this is the, the Seattle version taking to the water of Puget Sound. So with that, I'd like to uh, bring, the, bring it to a close, but I did want to point out that if anyone's interested in taking a look at the I items that we have up here, you're welcome to come up. I also brought out a, a really rare model of a head canoe that we were lucky enough to be able to acquire a few years ago. It's probably from the late 1700s, and uh, it would be on exhibit now if it weren't for the fact that it was about half an inch too long to go into our watercraft case that, <laughs> that we had ordered pre pre before we got that. So unfortunately, we'll have to do something about that to get it on display. But it is one of the few uh, that still exist in North America, and there's only one other one that I know of in Alaska. So it's a pretty special thing to, to see, and also you can see mixed models uh, close up. So with that, I'd like to thank you for coming tonight and uh, just uh, wanted to ask if anyone had any questions or comments.
but you've shown great dedication uh, for sitting through the program on such a beautiful evening, and I hope there's still a little bit of it left to enjoy. Did you have a question in the back? Well, the, the ones in the photos are, that was uh, after they stopped making the cedar bark sails and they were just using sail cloth or canvas for those that show up in the photo. The question was about the material for the, the sails in some of the photos of the canoes under sail. So yeah, sail cloth or, or canvas. You, you said that there was, they used to make their sails out of cedar bark? Right, plated red cedar bark, yes. Like woven? Right. Okay. Yeah, like the checkerboard, like when you're, when you're making a placemat in, in grade school out of strips of construction paper when you're... <laughs> <laughs> but there, it's much harder to weave cedar bark like that. <laughs> so any other questions or comments? Yes. Oh yeah. What the steaming actually did. Uh, Mick, do you want to address that? Steaming is a way to get something bigger than what you start with. It makes it, um, it's like if this is the log and this part here comes up a little bit, by steaming it, you can actually make it wider. It stretches you, using that spruce. Okay. It doesn't yeah. go back. <laughs> no, because you have the um, seats in there, the thwarts. Oh, right. That'll keep it spread. Okay, thank you. And then you'd also put a piece of wood up there on the gunnel, and that'll stiffen it too. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, so you showed that, uh, uh, that cedar, that... I think it was the big tree where they carved out all those canoes. I mean, was that a typical technique where they would like cut down the tree and then cut it down the middle and then start from there? Yeah, what, is that your? Yeah, I mean, I think they they were if they found a a beautiful canoe log, if they could get more than one canoe out of it, they would definitely do that. So uh, even though that's the only photo like that that I've seen, I'm sure it was uh, you know a pretty common technique. And you would, would you steam it out the, is that how you would get it out? Yep, the, yeah, the, that kind you would spread with steam and hot water also. And you just chip away at it, is that what? Yep. Can I add one? Yeah. Sure. Um, what, what's important between the different tribes is the kind of trees that they have. Uh, with, with any of this, uh, wood dictates form. And so it, the red cedar, it's a big log they can make big canoes. And by adding those two pieces, they can make them really big. But wood really dictates what's the form. And up here in Upper Northern, we didn't have any red cedar. And so we had smaller canoes. So they were just a little bit different. But wood dictates form. Okay, anything else? Well, again, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you.